HS2 is a project that is often misunderstood, frequently in the media, and beset with political arguments and controversy. In some ways, it's not surprising. It's the largest engineering project in Europe. But why is it in the news for all the wrong reasons so frequently? What's gone wrong? Number one, confusion over what it is actually for. What was the point of HS2 in the first place? Britain's railway is unusual in two respects compared to its European counterparts. First, it has seen a remarkable growth in passengers. In 1997, total passenger journeys were 800 million. By 2019, the year before the COVID-19 pandemic, it had doubled to 1.75 billion on a railway network that was basically the same size. The last time it carried 1.75 billion passenger journeys was the mid-1920s, a time when cars were the preserve of the super-rich and the railways were the undisputed mode of transport for the vast majority of people. And now, five years after COVID, passenger journeys have recovered and are basically back to the record high of 2019. Second, it is one of the most intensively used railways in Europe. Our main lines are the busiest railways of all. The West Coast Main Line is widely regarded as the busiest mainline railway in Western Europe. In 1997, when Virgin took over running the principal train franchise on the route, they carried 14 million passengers per annum. By the time Virgin transferred operations to Avanti West Coast, that number had risen to 40 million, a near trebling on infrastructure that had been upgraded but with no new lines built other than the four-track of the Trent Valley in Staffordshire. The problem in Britain is that so many different types of trains compete for space on the track, yet they travel at different speeds. On the West Coast Main Line, tilting trains travel at 125 miles an hour, alongside 100 mile an hour regional trains and slower local trains, and then freight trains running at 60, 75 and 90 miles an hour. The West Coast Main Line is one of the busiest freight corridors in the country, vital for the transport of goods that keep our economy functioning. The purpose of HS2 was simple, get all of the fastest intercity trains off the current lines and onto a dedicated track where they can all run at the same high speed very efficiently, improving journeys and reducing the time they take, and then use all of the capacity freed up on the existing railway to run far more local, regional and freight trains. Everyone is a winner. And had the whole HS2 network got built, including the so-called Eastern Leg through the East Midlands and Leeds, and then onto a connection to Newcastle and Scotland, the benefits of far more capacity being made available on the existing railway would have been felt on the West Coast Main Line, the Midland Main Line and the East Coast Main Line. It would have been genuinely transformational. It was certainly never just about spending billions of pounds to get from London to Birmingham 10 minutes faster. Number two, think slow, act fast. We don't do this. In other European countries, they take longer to design and plan what they're going to do. But once they have a mature plan, they crack on with it. They don't keep changing their minds and they don't get distracted. With HS2, the government and HS2 almost certainly rushed the design phase, keen to get spades in the ground as soon as possible. But once they started, they found ground conditions and technical challenges that they weren't expecting. And although they have addressed them admirably, they have ended up making many changes that all add cost and delay. Number three, the politics of Britain. When the hybrid bill was passed in 2017 for phase one of HS2 from London to Birmingham, everyone thought nothing could get in the way of building the railway. How wrong they were. Over 8,200 planning consents still had to be secured from councils and planning authorities along the entire route, none of whom probably cared one jot about a railway line that was simply going to slice through and not stop in their local area. Parochialism ran riot. We ended up building miles and miles of tunnels, all hugely expensive and of questionable value, a bat shed that cost £100 million to mitigate the risk to around 300 bats, that's £333,000 per bat, and plenty of other structures that in other countries would probably not have been deemed appropriate or proportionate. HS2 has worked hard to mitigate the impact of the railway on the environment and complied with the law, which they have to do as anything else would be an offence. Plus, things always look much worse during construction than afterwards when they have been sympathetically landscaped. But instead of showing leadership and changing laws and regulations to support critical economic infrastructure such as HS2, something Parliament had decided it wanted to happen and by a huge majority, some politicians have attempted to hang HS2 out to dry instead. Although in fairness, HS2 does fight back. Number four, inflation. 
HS2 has been built at the worst possible time in one sense. The war in Ukraine, COVID-19 and all manner of global shocks have all impacted on unit cost of materials. Sir Andrew Haynes, the CEO of Network Rail, recently told the Transport Select Committee that on the existing railway, the price of ballast had risen by 80% and concrete sleepers by 75%. HS2 has been badly affected by these kinds of cost increases. Number five, governance or in English, how a project is led, managed and controlled. It's clear that the way the project has been set up and managed has been flawed. Everyone involved takes some part of the blame for this, from ministers and civil servants down, through the project leadership itself and into the contractors and the supply chain. The lack of a clear structure for who is responsible for what has caused confusion, delay and cost. As has the slow pace of decision making by government. Sometimes the lack of any decision can be more costly for a project than a decision that is slightly wrong in some respects, but at least is a decision. Number six, short-termism. We are also remarkably fickle in the UK. Crossrail in London, a railway line now known to millions of people as the Elizabeth Line, was once a byword for incompetent project management, cost overruns and delay. In short, it too was an embarrassment. Fast forward a few years and now that's largely forgotten. Where once it was attacked, people jostle for position to lord its transformative effect. It is remarkable to note the number of people who now lay claim in 2025 for having been associated with delivering it. With one in seven of all train journeys in Britain being on the Elizabeth Line, all past sins are washed away and forgotten. Our memories are remarkably short. So is there now a way forward? The government clearly believes there is. A new review has been undertaken, a line in the sand, other cliches are available, has been drawn, and there's a new management team in town. One important element of the recent so-called project reset is a report by James Stewart, a seasoned and experienced project financier, into why HS2 has really gone wrong. The government has chosen to accept all 89 of Mr Stewart's recommendations. They are wise to do so. If behaviours do change as a result, then there's a chance that major infrastructure projects in the future will be planned and delivered more successfully than HS2. If not, then the embarrassment of HS2 could be felt for many years to come in other sectors and other projects. Meanwhile, in the absence of HS2, there is still no plan B on how to fix worsening congestion on the West Coast mainline. That remains a serious concern, and the mayors of Liverpool and Manchester in particular may yet find their aspirations for more local and regional trains held up for some time to come. Further delays, it seems, are inevitable.